And this is Cattell, K-A-T-T-E-L. Well, this whole block here is a mobile home park full of big tin cans that people live in that are excellent reflectors. This was a real hot area. Up here is a park, which is public area that I could be on, and it's a real strong area. And up here are some homes and a sidewalk I could be on. This is kind of high terrain here. And this is a graveyard, which was excellent. So from the graveyard, I really got a good line going up this way. Here, reflection hell. Here, reflection hell. Here, this way, kind of. But this whole area, this whole big thing is 46 acres. And this was a farm, a privately owned farm. And the town of Erie has grown around it. And I actually have a relative that used to be a police officer in the town of Erie. And this guy was kind of a thorn in their side. He raised bison and sometimes they got loose and got into town. And he had huge giant bonfires to burn his slash piles and trash and things. And the the town of Erie kept trying to annex or, or uh, seize this land or uh, take it, eminent domain, that's the word I was grasping for. And he held out, he, he finally got very uh, old and sold the property to the town finally, uh, just last November, and then went into a facility and passed away. So the town of Erie owns this now, but it's a very large area and I didn't want to trespass onto it. So, uh, doing, and by, by this time, BART and zero NYY and Kyle, um, KJM, WA something, KJM, W zero KJM. They joined me by this point and were helping out as well. And before we bothered the city, we did everything we could to really get confident, everything we could without trespassing, to get really confident that, yeah, we're pretty sure it's this property. And up in the corner of that property that's least accessible from the public is a house and an outbuilding. We finally pretty much eliminated everything else and we're happy with that. So we went into the town office where there's a receptionist that's the gatekeeper of all things Erie. And I was trying to think, how am I going to bring this up? Because I wanted to find out who's in charge of that property and get from, get escorted onto it. I was trying to think, how am I going to explain this? without being immediately thrown into a straight jacket. And the police buildings, of course, conveniently in the same building, so she probably has a button under her desk. She just pushes and they come running up. So I decided just to rip the Band-Aid off. And we walk in there and she says, yes, can I help you? And Bart is standing next to me and he looks like Sasquatch. And I said, yes, yes, you can. But I have to tell you, this is going to be the most bizarre thing you're going to hear all week. And she says, oh, no, 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 no. In addition to working at the front desk, I answer all the emails to this, all the general email to the address to the city. And you will not believe what I see in a week. So she looks at me and says, give it your best shot. So I'm okay. So we're radio amateurs. I live in Fort Collins and Bart lives in Evans, and there's this signal that we hear that we've tracked down and we've tracked it down to your town. And by the way, the signal's on an amateur radio frequency where you have to be licensed to operate. And this is not fitting the requirements of an amateur radio signal as far as ID and things like that. So we've tracked it down to your town all the way from Fort Collins and Evans. And by the way, we've tracked it down to a 46 acre farm that 
um, you guys just bought in November. And I'm trying to find out who is in charge of that that can escort us onto the property to find finish tracking this thing down and taking care of it. She says, I'm stand corrected. This is the strangest thing I've heard all week. You win the prize. And then she she got a hold of um, a person, a gentleman that's with their parks department who's going to be in charge of this, is, is in charge of the property. And he wasn't in. I got his email, sent him an email. I didn't go into a lot of technical detail initially. And he came back with the standard, sorry, due to liability reasons and hazards on the property, we certainly can't let anyone on at this time. And he goes on to say that he was a, a radio man in the Marine Corps for six years and is familiar with radio, which was excellent. And he's been on the property and he hasn't seen anything that could be the source of what I described. So since he broached that he had been in the Marines as a radio man, I, well, I was in the Army as a signal intelligence analyst. And here's the detail, since you're a radio man, here's, here's where we did direction finding from. Here's a screenshot. I sent him that screenshot of the, here's the signal. Oh, can you show the second? Uh, you saw that first movie, the other movie we made from the graveyard. Very close, very close line of sight to the source and it's a, it sounds better there's better audio on it and a lot stronger uh you'll see a lot stronger signal and this uh this recording was made with like a little two inch magma whip antenna on a sdr so yeah there we go that's the um the audio isn't planned but real nice strong clean re repeating so like yeah it's a heartbeat yeah. So, so I sent him that and it's like, oh yeah, it's definitely in the, it's definitely in this area. So if you can escort us on. So, well, this, that pulsing thing there. Yeah. Yeah. Something. I don't know. I don't know. So, yeah. So what this achieved was to get his curiosity engaged. So now he's wondering, well, what the heck is this? So now in the past, I've come across these sorts of things that have been irrigation system transmitters for large irrigation systems and, and things of that nature. And that's what turned out to be the case here. Uh, he led us on. And it's kind of a long driveway, and it was the longest driveway of my life because we made a special trip to come down. He made a special trip to meet us over there, and I'm driving down the driveway. And at this point, we're so close that I have a receiver with no antenna on it. I've just disconnected the antenna from a handheld receiver. And we're driving down the road, and I'm not hearing it, and not hearing it, and not hearing it. We're almost to the house, and I'm still not hearing anything, and I'm going to be very embarrassed if we're totally wrong, um, if you can show me the picture Bart's seeing, we, we get up by the house and there's a signal. We start walking around and on the south side of the farmhouse, there's Bart and there's two metal boxes on the wall there. And if I can find my cat toy again here. Contrast and lighting aren't all that good, but this is a, like a five element Yagi right here, 70 centimeter size ish. And we open that up and it's irrigation systems. And this was, a, like I said, a 46 acre property. This is way up at the northeast corner, way down at the southwest corner is um, a little shack with another antenna like that. And apparently it was a remote station for irrigation. This antenna is planting right at that mobile home park and then scattering off of it. Meeker is that way. So this antenna is pointing the wrong way and this building is in the way. And it's still, it was probably the reflection off the mobile homes that was hitting the south side of Meeker. So we open up the box to look inside and in the box along with irrigation timers and things is this transmitter box 
And for scale, that's an SMA connector there. We've unhooked it at this point. It says here the DC power input is 3.6 watts. So RF out might have been two watts, maybe. And 39 miles away, I'm hearing it. This was supposed to be, it says 433. There is an ISM, Industrial Scientific and Medical Band, around 433.92. It's an unlicensed band right in the middle of our allocation. And if you listen there, especially on AM, there's key fobs, weather stations, garage door openers, alarm systems, sprinkler systems. There's a ton of stuff you'll hear. And it kind of sounds cool on AM. Um, but if you have something that shows spectrum, you can see plus or minus 100 kilohertz or more. There's just all sorts of stuff. This thing had finally drifted. It had finally drifted down to 432, which is well outside of the ISM band. And um, they uh, they said, oh, okay, it was us. Because I'm holding holding this handheld receiver. And as soon as I pull the power plug off that, it stops. And he was like, okay, that's pretty irrefutable. <laughs> so they they were going to replace this entire irrigation system anyway this year. So he left that unplugged and uh, we solved that curiosity. A um, few things I learned. Yep. We, we unhooked the power, and I said, I had this other incident where something was actually getting in a repeater, and we unplugged the power, and somebody else came along and plugged it back in. And he goes, oh, okay. And he, uns he unscrewed the antenna from that afterwards. We didn't tell him that if someone plugs it back in without an antenna, it will probably destroy the transmitter, but... Yeah? Uh, the question, did I use ballistics? What I wanted to do was I wanted to actually take the transmitter and take it home and autopsy it. He said, well, until we replace the system, I don't know what happens if we start unplugging all sorts of stuff in here. So we'll just do this much for now until we, uh, until we get into it. Uh, question in the corner. Oh yeah, we've been doing some coordinating stuff. So some things I learned are uh, always direction finding in a mountainous terrain is, especially on UHF and VHF, can be very interesting. I always think that you're seeing a reflection when you're getting a, when things are going too well, I suspect that something's wrong. And I always think you might be chasing a reflection. Um, if you're using a direction, because there's directional antenna based direction finding. This is a Yagi I was going to talk about a little bit more. Um, there are tape measure Yagis. There's popular designs for two meters. Some people in the room have built. Those have been scaled to 70 centimeter as well. If you're using any kind of directional antenna to hunt something, um, be aware, first of all, Yagis have limited bandwidth. If you're too far out of the design band, you're going to get a weird pattern. Uh, so whatever antenna you're going to use or whatever direction finding system at all you're going to use, test it first on the frequency you're going to be used, you know, tracking way out in an open area. And I mean like way out in an open area like Pawnee National Grasslands um, where, because chain link fences another a thing that wasn't in these pictures but just north of here are the great big giant steel pylon power poles for the high tension lines the big robot looking ones and those were running through right just north of here so when you get into uhf street signs chain link fences um road signs, vehicles, all sorts of stuff. Not only will reflect, but can even change the polarization of your signal. Uh, so uh, be aware of that. Uh, another thing is use an attenuator. When I got in too close, uh, the radio I had had a variable RF gain and a, 
a single attenuation button that put in like 10 dB of attenuation. That was not enough and I was just swamped. So you got that picture of that K attenuator. Having some sort of an attenuator you can put in line is real helpful. This is a common model made by a company called K. I have one almost like it, except I only have one 20 dB spot on the left and then the rest of those. So I've got 41 dBs of total attenuation with that, which is still not quite enough in some locations, some cases, but it's very helpful. So if you're at all interested in direction finding and you see one of these at a ham fest, buy it. Um, be aware that one at the top right corner says 50 ohms. They're also made in a 75 ohm version and the BNC connectors look the same. Doug, I think they are different. And if you try to jam a 50 ohm BNC cable onto it, you might damage the cable or the connector or not make a connection anyway. So there might be a problem. Right. So there's a smaller pin on the 75 ohm. Yeah. Yeah, so so those connectors are not compatible. So make sure you're buying, make sure you know what you're buying and that you can use it properly, whether it's 50 or 75 ohm. Make sure you have the right connectors for it. So that helps with any kind of amplitude-based direction planning to knock the signal down. But so know your antenna, know the pattern that it has out in the open. And if it has a really good null, which it should, if it's a DF antenna, when you're out in the open, if you're out somewhere and there's no null, you're not finding a null anywhere, you're getting a direct path and you're getting a reflection that's filling in the null from somewhere else. So those are kind of some of the things I learned. Lastly, um, this antenna that I'll pass around, there's a guy named Kent Britton, WA5VJB, and he builds, or he designs, he's patented this antenna, but it's free for amateur use. He came up with a unique feed that's like a half a folded dipole. And in free space all by itself, it would be about 150 ohms. And then he uses his spacing of his driven and reflecting elements to load that down to 50 ohms. Uh, very handy antennas. Um, if you Google the term cheap Yagi, you'll find his spreadsheets. He has designs, and he primarily does weak signals, single sideband. He has designs for two meters, 220, 70 centimeter, uh, 902, 1296, 2304. And on those higher bands, he makes these he and others make these on printed circuit board he uses pcb construction to make some of the microwave ones but um, great source for um, antenna design he uses little square wooden beams like half inch by half inch wood beams for his uh, boom and i prefer you know start passing that around i prefer the uh, pvc um, so trying to find some square section carbon fiber tubing about half by half inch, which would be easier to keep all the drilling in a line all in in on axis if I have to move the I'll make like three, four foot long boom antennas for weaker signal work and it's hard to keep them all in line on a round tube. So uh Dick had a question. I mean, far away from potential reflectors. Yeah, no, no. Um, antenna, antenna to test source, just a few wavelengths is fine. So, so VHF, UHF, if you're 50 feet away and running really low power. Um, I was doing some testing in my backyard on another antenna the other day, and I've got a Diamond X50 on the roof right now. And I put a signal generator on that on UHF at one milliwatt, and that was way too much power. Uh, I was 100 feet away, and it was too much. So 
I had to cut it down from one milliwatt. But if you can turn the power down on a source, you can be 50 feet away. Excellent, excellent question. And I'll repeat the question. Do I use any kind of software to try to identify what type of signal this might be in order to um, help identify the source? Um, and he, he's named some software like Artemis. There's a website, Signal ID Wiki, SIG ID Wiki, and they have audio clips and little spectrum movies of hundreds of different voice and non-voice data, telemetry, voice communication, digital data, digital voice signals. So you can try to figure out from HF through microwave, you can try to figure out what the heck is this? And if you can figure out, so um, I do look at, and having been a monitoring hobbyist for decades, I, I can usually tell um, there was a thing a couple of years ago that I was trying to track down. It was some noise that kept pumping up right on 432.1, which is our um, 70 centimeter weak signal. And because we were doing 70 centimeter weak signal, we were listening on single sideband and I tracked it down to the Broomfield area where it was getting quite strong. And same thing, reflection hell, I couldn't track it down to the last block. Um, and I was still listening to it in single sideband. Well, then I flipped over to FM narrowband and it was a voice ID <laughs> on someone's repeater that they decided to put on that frequency. And I was like, oh, duh. So yeah, it's important to try different modes, especially once once you get closer and you're getting a good clear signal to try listening to it in different modes and look at the look at the spectrum and, and i almost always use software to find radios so i'm usually seeing the spectrum and the uh and hearing you know the spectrum and waterfall display i'm usually seeing those and that helps but yeah trying to figure out well what kind of what kind of signal is this um is useful. Uh-huh, question. Yeah. 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 The the gentleman's statement was that he's done a lot of this with fox hunting, and everything's in antenna, and you have unshielded equipment. Uh, the attenuator I showed was a uh, fully encased in metal, and it had metal partitions between each stage. The radio I was using, the handheld, was an ICOM R20, which has a plastic case, but it's pretty well shielded. I don't know if it's coated on the inside. So um, with that radio, I want a little leakage because at the end, when I get close, I will take the antenna completely off. And I still want a little bit of RF to leak in there so I can, just using signal strength, I can walk in on the signal. But um Yeah, exactly. When you get in close, you can start using, um, I was using shorter and shorter antennas. I had a, um, I had a little magma antenna that comes with the RTL dongles that can be shortened down to two inches. But at some point you can use like a paper clip as a very short little antenna to stick 
if you have a BNC connector on your receiver, stick a paper clip in there as a short antenna. And again, if you've got a little case leakage, once you get once you get within a hundred feet of the thing. Um, another thing, this this type of source was more challenging because it was a directional antenna at the source, which can also confuse you if you're doing a um, amplitude based direction finding. Because I could be pretty close, but completely on the side of his Yagi and and not really hear anything and because most yaggies have a real deep null off to the side and then i'd be out in front of it but i'd be two miles away and and be full scale yeah yeah offset attenuator um the question was any experience with uh the offset attenuators I've never used one. The idea is, and I think Aero Antennas sells one. There we go. The idea with an offset attenuator is if you're getting direct leakage into your receiver, so you're not getting a null or you're not getting a consistent pattern because you're getting RF leakage in directly, an offset attenuator is an attenuator it also has a local oscillator mixer and it will shift the frequency coming into it by some amount. I don't know. I don't know how much, but it will, it will move the frequency off a little bit. So you tune to the offset that way your radio is ignoring the direct frequency, direct frequency leakage that's getting into it and it is only seeing the offset frequency might be like a megahertz or so of, of shift four megahertz so that gets you out of the band and it gets you hopefully to a clear area in the spectrum and now you're um now you're hunt now you're seeing just the attenuated signal and of course the offset attenuator is built into a nice rf tight case so it doesn't suffer the leakage problem that you're your receiver might be. Uh, any other Doug? Doug's gonna Doug's gone for a microphone. Mike, is this working? There we go. Uh, Greg, thank you for sharing this. When you get into these, you're kind of entering the twilight zone, aren't you? And I too was in the twilight zone with some interference recently, and you guys might get a kick out of this. I was working on a commercial public safety repeater down in Cherry Creek. And they were severe interference on the input. So I started direction finding it. And this is basically like Northwest Parker, Cherry Creek. And I'm seeing all these signals aiming towards Buckley and other areas. Well, it wasn't down there. I eventually DF'd it to Carter Lake up on the hill and it was 60 miles away from the repeater, but it was a stuck uh, SCADA transmitter. It wasn't sending Morse, wasn't sending real data, so I couldn't demodulate it. It was just crap data coming out. Probably got hit by lightning and the keying transistor keyed and it was just sending random bits, but uh, no license for it. So I tracked it down and I'm looking and I see these signs that say private area. I'm using my antennas had mobile Doppler, I had the similar antenna, and it's coming from this development on the east side of Carter Lake. So I'm like, well, it's marked residents and guests only. I look up on the hill, there's a tower with a tribander and a 40 meter small Yagi on it. So I called a knowledgeable guy in the area named James Sizek, and he goes, oh, that's Jonathan's house. He's the owner of the Golden Corral. <laughs> so I call him up and I said, may I be your guest? He says, come on up. I'll meet you in the driveway. We get in the driveway. We take the Yagi and it's pointed to a water tank. So being this was public safety, I called back to the FCC engineer in Denver that had been assigned this. The FCC picked up this interference complaint in 30 minutes from filing. But it was public safety and it was bothering the sheriff's department. So they're very fast on those. And he goes, what do you mean you found it? Please tell me you weren't trespassing. 
I said, no, no, no. I had the property owner's permission to be there. And he goes, could I be his guest as well? He goes up there and we found it. It was a bad skater transmitter. His final words after they pulled the plug on it was, we're not allowed to take it off the wall. We're not allowed to take it out of there. I gave him your phone number. And if you could remove it and please bring it down to the workbench at the FCC, we'd like to take it apart as well. So another experience being in the twilight zone. Matt. We're gonna. Greg, you remember when I was uh, having interference over at my old house and everything, uh, you and Gary and OJ and all of us were out looking around for it and we couldn't really pinpoint where it was. Well, later that year we had a hailstorm and I had to have my roof replaced. And when they were taken off the shingles and everything, they inadvertently got rid of my RF through a, a short in my attic fan. So and that was the that was the problem. I had a short in the attic fan up there in the in in the attic that was causing all that that interference that we were trying to figure out where it was from. <laughs> So <laughs> it that, went away right, right, right quickly. <laughs> that that brings that brings up a couple of good points, but but um, like I said earlier, and and also now we've kind of gone into the area of interference, which is one thing I've DF'd, which can be just random noise or whatever. Um, um, that brings up one story that there's someone in this very room that was having uh, HF noise problems, and I came into that person's neighborhood in Fort Collins uh, with some loop antennas and other things and started driving around. And one common source, especially now, of HF noise is uh, grow lights for marijuana farms, <laughs> large or small marijuana farms or cultivations. And either halogen grow lights or now the LED grow lights can be quite a source of noise all the way up through two meters. And um, this was an HF problem. And this is the second time this has happened now where I start walking around looking like the weird guy pointing antennas at houses and people are peering out from their doorway and all of a sudden the noise stops and never comes back. And that happened with someone in this very room. Um, I'll leave it to that person if they want to stand up or not, but um, someone in their neighborhood was doing something and it stopped suddenly. Never to return as far as I know. Um, the other point, interference noise. Um, I've been doing this a long time and I've developed a, a time-saving protocol if I come across some weird signal. Uh, first of all, is it really there? There are plenty of different receivers that have what are called birdies where you're tuning around and it looks like there's a signal. Unhook your antenna and see if it goes away. If it goes away, if it doesn't go away when you unhook your antenna, it's internal to the receiver. It's not a real signal. If it goes away, it might still be a weird mixing product. So find a different receiver that has a different IF frequency or totally different architecture and look with a second receiver that's totally different and see if you still see the same signal in the same place. Do those two things before you start building an antenna to go direction finding. Then next thing is make sure it's not coming from your own house like Matt just said. Turn off your sensitive things first like um, their cable box and computers and stuff like that. Turn those off to protect them and then turn off the main breaker and see if it was something in your house. Then if it's a strong enough signal you can pick up with a handheld, just walk around your own neighborhood and see if it's very, very local to you. Again, before you build an, I'm speaking from experience, before you build a specific antenna for a specific weird frequency to start hunting this thing and finding out it was really coming from your own outbuilding. So 
do those things first and then and then if it's a real signal coming from outside your neighborhood then you can go hunting well it was and it wasn't my current outbuilding this was in california and i saw a weird C narrow band cw just a continuous unmodulated spike around 27 megahertz and it wasn't on off or anything it was just there and um built a df antenna for 27 megahertz and as soon as i left <laughs> drove away from the house the signal was gone okay and um i had an outbuilding and we had fostered a squirrel and as it was returning to nature it was at a stage in its life where it had a nesting box in the outbuilding it could come and go as it wanted to and then and then um, return to the nesting box if it wanted to sleep there and we had a, a infrared camera in the nesting box hardwired a cctv you know the old school coax going to a cctv camera and it i guess it had an internal oscillator or something a local clock or something at 27 megahertz and that and that was it and so so yeah that was that was direct experience Uh, another thing that can be helpful for finding local interference is just shut off the power, total power to your house and see if it goes away. And that's a quick, easy test. Although you've got to go back and reset all your clocks. Yep. Yeah, grab the mic there. I was curious about the radio setup. You, you said you used SDR. Uh, do you have like an SDR receiver that goes into like a laptop that you carry around and an antenna or what do you? Yes. Uh, question was what SDR setup do I use? Um, first of all, at home, I've got various SDRs. I can just unhook an antenna if, if I have one of my antennas is on the band I need and hook that up to, to see what I can hear at the house. Uh, up at Rattlesnake Ranch, um, because we have the remote microwave backbone up there uh, through NCARC. Um, I have a, temporarily, because there's a, a Diamond X50 that's not being used at the moment, although it's going to change the spring, um, I have a Raspberry Pi 4 with an SDR Play RSP DX receiver. Um, they have just come out, I'll expand on that, but, but that's a remote receiver that I can access through the microwave backbone. There are multiple software programs that will serve spectrum, uh, over internet, either local area network or over internet full blown. Um, the backbone has incredible bandwidth but to get to my house it has to go through my isp and there's a choke point there and if you've worked at all with software defined radio you hear the term iq or in phase quadrature unprocessed raw rf data stream which is very wide bandwidth very high speed data i have trouble getting that all the way through all the way to my desktop um, because of the choke point with my ISP, unless I'm looking at a narrow chunk of spectrum. Uh, British company SDR Play, who I have no fiduciary interest in, and it will not be remunerated for these comments, uh, they have finally come out with a piece of software called SDR Connect. They're, they're Previous software was Windows, which I don't use. Um, SDR Connect works in Windows, Linux, or Mac. And it has a built-in server client function. And not only can their server client serve raw IQ data if you have enough bandwidth, like you're on your own LAN, they have a mode where the processing is done at the server end, which would be the remote end. And it just serves video of the waterfall and spectrum display 
and the demodulated audio. And that lets me look at a big piece of spectrum and hear a demodulated channel and get that all through a narrow pipe. If you could play that first video again. That screen recording I had done from Rattlesnake Ranch, that was SDR Connect software. And um, that's the interface right there. And um, so that's that's what I use for that. But yeah, when I go out, if I go out, depending on, like the second video I did from the graveyard, I had a laptop and a little Air Spy SDR and a short antenna, and I used that setup to record that video from that location. So um, depending on what the frequency is I'm hunting, um, I may just use a handheld receiver if I just need a bar graph of signal strength. That worked. So that there is GQ. Yeah, that's uh, that's some Linux software there called GQRX using a uh, Air Spy SDR on site, you know, near the source in the graveyard. And that's the GQRX interface, which is for Linux and Mac. And with with the SDR, all the different SDR software, you can adjust gain and demodulation bandwidth and filter sizes and all sorts of stuff. You've got you've got a lot more uh, fine grained control of settings than you do on a on a on just a super hat physical receiver. All right, thank you. Doug's got a, Doug's got a comment. I'll make one final comment. Uh, what Greg said about uh, check out your, your spurs and things. On one of the ones I'm doing in Boulder right now, I'm looking for uh, interference on 700 megs. And my computer had a birdie, and the hotspot in the car had a birdie, and I was chasing my own tail. So always make sure you're looking for the real signal. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. Appreciate it. I thank you all for coming this morning online and in person. It's been a great day. Y'all have a great week, and we'll see you next month. Well, thank you. Tip your waitress. Yes, and be sure and tip your waitress. Thank you very much. <laughs>